Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emily and I have been asked by the Austral's Edge Corps to talk to you guys about how you would weigh arguments as a judge. So I have a little slideshow because I hate looking at my own face when you're recording a video, so we'll play that instead. Awesome, let's get started. Um, so when you're weighing arguments as a judge, this slideshow or presentation is meant to be for beginner judges as well as advanced judges but also could be helpful if you're planning on speaking at Austral's and you want to know how to make your points uh, more persuasive. So I think that there are two key ways in which a judge should uh, weigh an argument. And I think that's by assessing the quality of the argument as well as the impact. So I'm gonna go through those two things during this presentation. And then I will give you an example of how I use those two skills um, when weighing arguments when I'm deliberating on a debate. So basically the two different things, quality and impact mean different things. Quality means whether it actually proves something. So you say that you're going to achieve a point and then you do all the logical steps and you make the persuasive argument to get to the end and have the judge believe that that's an outcome that's going to happen as opposed to impact, which is this is how the argument affects the debate or here are the harms or here are the benefits associated with this argument. So let's just jump into quality. I think that there are a number of things that you can use to assess uh, the quality of the debate and I've written them down here. So one is comparative analysis. So you might have a situation where one person makes a case uh, for something happening and then the other person makes that same case but in the opposite way. Often when people respond, they just choose to put their analysis on top of the other person. So they'll say, your world isn't happening because our world is more persuasive. But really true comparative analysis and high quality analysis involves taking apart that argument on its face. So even though we have this way better argument, even if your argument still stood, here's why it wouldn't work. Uh, another measure of quality is assertiveness. Um, so people will just say that certain things are true. Obvious example is the sky is blue, which you can probably take at on its face value in a debate. But there are other things, for example, why people um, have certain lived experiences or how political action actually takes place. Those are the sort of things that you can't just assert that they happen without explaining it to the judge. Uh, the next thing is reasonable belief. So even if you try to explain it well, there are some things that probably aren't going to be persuasive and high quality points just because they're completely unrealistic. Something like saying that in the next half an hour, a giant asteroid is going to explode and everyone on earth is going to die um, for an extreme example of that. The next thing is defensive against rebuttal because the quality of a point is not just the point that you make, it's that when it gets attacked, you need to defend that point and stand up for it. Um, obviously things that are not indicators of quality include voice, accent, tone, or saying things that align with your personal benefits or beliefs or the judge's personal beliefs. Um, so I'm just gonna take an example of a debate that happened at 2020 Austral's, which the motion for that is that the government should provide incentives for uh, urban poor to migrate to rural areas. I have two similar arguments here. One is for the app and one is for the neg. And you'll notice that they both take up a similar amount of uh, space on the page, but one of them is more high quality than the other. So if you look at the first example, uh, the line of analysis here is that most people who want to live in urban areas can't afford a house. Rent is the biggest expense that you have to pay. So reducing the cost of your rent would improve lives and housing is cheaper in rural areas, so more people will get affordable housing. And the reason why I don't think this is a terrible point, but the reason why I don't think that this point is extremely high quality is because there are a lot of assertions in that that you have to rely upon. So the first bullet point, um, the fact that most people can't afford to live in a house. In reality, this is true for most people living in urban centers around the world, but, it might not be the situation in some cases, and you would want to explain why that's likely to happen. So basically more people living there, more competition, which drives up demand, which drives up market price. Um, the next point being rent is the biggest expense that you have to pay, so reducing costs will improve your lives. Again, that's another assertion because there are lots of different things that could cost you money. 
uh, things like medical pills, food, um, so you probably need to explain why that is. And then the final uh, assertion here is that housing is cheaper in rural areas, so more people will get affordable housing. Um, and there are a few different assertions there. One, that it's cheaper, um, even though, again, you could pretty easily explain why often this is true. Um, two, that there's simply just going to be enough supply of houses in those areas. So as you're making that point, the person who is delivering the speech is making a lot of logical jumps, which mean that the quality of the argument might not be as high. If we look at the second example, we can see a different line of analysis. Um, this being the most vulnerable people are heavily reliant on government support because of structural barriers to employment. So you probably would want to flesh that out a little bit more if you were giving a speech, but that's saying things like people who are discriminated against find it hard to get jobs, which means that in order to get money for food or anything like that, um, they often have to rely on welfare that the government should provide. Um, again, there could be a slight assertion here about the fact that the government's actually providing that care, but less so than the other argument. Finally, governments can use scale of uh, economies of scale in urban areas to provide services. Um, so again, in a debate, you would probably want to expand on what economies of scale means, but in this situation, uh, it's easier to have 1,000 people treated in one hospital than 1,000 people treated in multiple hospitals across the country. Um, so that's being rounded up there. So those in rural areas will get less access to such services, such as education, because it's not all condensed in one spot. So I think that the second argument, even though I've gone through and fleshed it out a little bit more than what's on the page, it has a higher quality argument um, and that may affect when you're weighing up these two points, which is the most effective or persuasive. So another thing to consider isn't just whether the point made is made well, but whether that point actually matters for the debate. Um, this was some feedback that I actually got when I was speaking at, at a tournament and I always do the graph in my head because sometimes it makes it easier to explain. But impact can exist in two different ways, one being the degree of harm and two being the quantity of harm. So that being one, how bad it is to a person or actor versus how many people are affected. So you see the three different points on the graph here. The first one, a small number of people will be deeply affected. So let's say, I don't know, 1% of people will die if this motion goes ahead. Um, second, many people will be somewhat affected, so people are affected by broad brush policies that raise their rent, make their lives more expensive, make things harder to do. And then finally, the majority of people will be uh, minor, uh, affected in a minor way. Um, everyone in the world gets a paper cut or something like that. And the thing to recognize here is that there's no right or wrong or no place that people should be on the graph. It's more what the speaker does to convince you using these two things. So a really good speaker will try to bring it right up into that top right corner of the graph by saying that this is going to have a huge effect on a huge amount of people. Whereas a less strategic speaker would probably be in the bottom left corner of the graph when they say, oh, not many people will be affected by it, but even if they are, it won't be too bad. So that's just how you might want to weigh the impact um, of a speech. So basically, there are situations where in, ideally, in an ideal world, debaters will explain to you and do that weighing to you or for you before you have to write it down on the page. And that's what you tend to see in high quality debates. So as people are making their points, they'll say, this is the most important thing in the debate because of this, or here's what's going to happen. A million people are going to be able to get jobs now or something like that. So they will be telling you as the adjudicator why their material is the most important thing in the debate. And an extra thing that high quality debates will contain is direct engagement with the opposition's weighing. So let's say if you had a motion that's about uh, healthcare systems and one person, one side says that it's better for your personal autonomy and then the other side says it's actually better for your longevity. Both teams in a high quality room would break down actively acknowledge the other team's weighing and explain why theirs is more persuasive. Mid-quality debates, you tend to get some weighing. So again, people will say, we care about longevity versus we care about autonomy, but uh, speakers won't necessarily, or teams won't necessarily engage with each other's conceptions of the world. And they'll kind of just like leave it up to you to guess. 
Um, low quality debates, there tends to be no weighing or the closest thing that you get to weighing is rhetoric where people are just like, this would be really, really bad. It would be really sad. Um, here are some harms. And the thing to notice here is that the less weighing debaters give you, the more you have to insert yourself into the debate, um, which is hard because when you have to insert yourself into the debate, you're more prone to slipping up, you're more prone to biases, you're more prone to personal preference as opposed to judging things from uh, the perspective of the average reasonable person who is judging the debate. So even though high quality debates may be more confusing because you may have to track that engagement and that weighting, as well as the other points that are existing in the debate and as well as the quality of the points, that's actually good because the debaters are leading you to that argument. Whereas in low quality debates, sometimes you're just like, oh my God, I don't know who's proved anything. I don't know what's important. I don't know what, what is and what is not. And that often means that when you go to give your adjudication, one of those teams will be like, I have no idea how you got to that conclusion. Clearly my team's analysis was the most important thing in the debate and no one wins in that case. But again, if you get caught in that situation where you have to weigh those arguments based on the quality and doing that impacting on the graph yourself, usually what I like to do during an adjudication is acknowledge that. So I don't say this was a low quality debate, but what I do say is that this was a bit of a messy debate because there was a there was no clarity as to what the defined goal of the debate was. This meant that I had to break it, the arguments down on their merits and potentially insert myself into the debate a little bit here. And by flagging that and explaining why you chose to weigh some points above, above the others and doing that during your adjudication will uh, make people far more sympathetic to uh, the job that you had to do and how you came to that conclusion. Um, because often if you just say there's no weighing, so I randomly decided on this thing, then someone's going to end up upset. So basically, those are the two most important things, in my opinion, the quality of the argument and also the importance of the argument. Um, you can choose as an adjudicator when you're deliberating or even during the debate how you're going to assess this, how you're going to deliver your adjudication. I personally like to do it in three steps. So the it's actually weird because it sounds like there's two, the quality importance thing, but what I actually do is start with um, the, what's the most important part. And so I, I start with um, the impact of the points and then I go into the quality of the points and then I go back to impact and kind of wrap it all up. So what I like to do as step one is determining the most important thing in the debate. And this is something that I'm listening out for throughout the entire debate. Usually by the time that the leader's replies are, are going on, the room will have clearly identified what that thing is, or you will be persuaded one way or another um, what that thing is. So that doesn't mean you've decided who's won the debate before it's over, but it's flagging what is the key metric on which this debate is going to be won. The second thing that I like to do is assess whether that's been proven. Um, so even if everyone's talking about the most important thing in the debate, if no one actually gets any ground or covers any ground on that important thing, then that will also affect your decision and how you weigh that up against the other points, which leads me to step three, assessing whether secondary concerns outweigh what has already been proven. So if I just step this through um, with some examples, the Austral's 2020 motion that we support gamification in the workplace, uh, you could have two different perspectives. So one team could say the most important thing in this debate is workers' well-being, and the other could say it's productivity. So let's say in the debate we've heard some far better and higher quality argumentation from that first team as to why workers' well-being has been achieved. That means that I would start off my adjudication by saying, I thought there were multiple points in the debate, here's what they were, but ultimately this debate, the most important thing was workers' well-being. And then by identifying that and explaining the reasons why you came to that conclusion, it then shapes the rest of your adjudication. So I would then move on my adjudication to be like, okay, this is a, now a discussion between both teams as to who gets better outputs for workers' well-being. Uh, so that's when you do the normal stuff in your adjudication, you go back and forth, you analyze the rebuttal, you analyze the strengths of the arguments. And then finally, um, and I think this part is also really important, it's to assess whether 
those tangential things. So in this example, it would be productivity. What effect they have on the debate? And there are two reasons for this. The first is that it's really important for every team or every argument to be addressed in the adjudication um, so that the speakers know that you heard the whole debate, that you listened and that you considered their arguments, but there is a reason why you found them to be less conclusive or less important. And the second reason is that sometimes the secondary concerns do actually outweigh that primary concern. So going back to that example before, if we say step one, uh, we've determined that the most important thing is workers' well-being. But let's say during step two, the other side has had like a whole bunch of responses explaining, actually, no, it's perfectly fine for your well-being in these ways. In fact, here are some reasons why it's better. They mitigate most of the harms that the first team wants to bring along. This means that at the end of step two, you could be like, okay, I really cared about workers' well-being, but I wasn't convinced that F made any meaningful change in that respect. Because then you can go on to step three and explain, while F wasn't able to make effective change in this thing that they labeled to be the most important, uh, the second team or the negative team managed to bring up a number of concerns that outweighed the marginal impact um, that the first team made. So I believed that there were going to be significant impacts to productivity. And even though it was not the primary issue in the debate, the scale of those impacts and the quality of those arguments meant that it was more powerful than the small amount of change to workers' well-being that the affirmative team made. So that's just an example of how I like to step through and weigh those arguments. Um, but you can do whatever suits you as long as you're considering both the quality and the impact of each argument and not only considering it, but explaining it to the speakers in the debate as you go and how you reach those conclusions.